Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. But there always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here's your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the information on last week's show, Time Management, Work-Life Balance, and Productivity informative. If you are unable to join us and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on our YouTube and Facebook pages, as well as multiple favorite podcast platforms. If you'd like to receive notifications on when our podcasts have been uploaded, please like and subscribe. If there are topics you'd find beneficial or questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me at media at abandp.com. Now let's learn a little bit about our guest today. Ian Moyce, Chief Revenue Officer, One Up Sales, was awarded the accolade of UK Sales Director of the Year by BESMA, British Excellence in Sales Management Awards, and was listed in the top 50 sales keynote speakers by Top Sales World in 2019 and 2020. Ian has been a regular judge on the Women in Sales Awards, WISA, Top Sales Awards, BESMA, and the UK Cloud Awards. So welcome to the show, Ian. Thank you, Candy. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Well, I always ask guests to share a little bit more about themselves before we get into kind of the meat of the topic, because I gave a little tiny bit of your bio, but I'm sure there's so much more to share. So let us know a little bit about you and how did you even start discussing revenue growth with entrepreneurs? Sure. So I've been through the journey, I guess, learning the hard way organically, my background I started for my sins as a programmer at IBM uh, in the technical side of the industry I work in, in in technology and saw an opportunity to be an inside sales in a company no one had heard of against everyone's advice, took it and uh, quickly uh, just worked hard there. Right? I, I had the view of I knew what I was talking about. How hard can sales be? <laughs> How little you know, right? So uh, I, I joined inside sales had a paper, phone book, whatever, and just had to learn on the job sort of thing. We were a fast growing small company and did that. I was promoted to field sales. That was in the channel, did that for many years, then ended up managing people as often uh, uh, comes upon you if, if you're successful in sales. And I've had the pleasure of, of managing large teams in large uh, global brand names, but also working in a lot of smaller businesses where, where the name isn't known, the product's not known, but you've got something good that can bring value to, to prospective customers. And I've had the role of building a team and growing the business, figuring out how do we grow this, figuring out what do we need to do? What are the actions? And I thrive on that innovating. And that isn't innovating technology or product. It's innovating. What do we do differently? How do we change? How do we stay relevant to the customer and how do we drive growth? Um, and through that, I, I, I've had, you know, I think I've done seven or eight smaller firms now, and four of them I've led the revenue through to exit. So uh, it, it's a fun journey. You learn a lot by getting hands on and do, doing it the hard way, I guess, is learning organically. And I still profess I'm still learning today, even though having done this for a long time. I think we're all going to learn until the end of our lives, right? There's always something. Abs absolutely. And too often I find people are, and we may come on to that, that people do what they did 10 years ago and think, well, I've got into that habitual nature of this now. I know what I'm doing. So why do I need to learn anything new? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's too bad. You know, they're missing out on the opportunities. So, but I would love to start with talking about when you go into an organization that you're going to begin working with, what is the first thing that you kind of approach to do, you know, in terms of making change? Sure. So the first thing, I guess, is, is, not, is not making change. It's, and, and I've seen people come into companies where I've been there, we've all seen it, I think, where, um, and I remember one example with, with the very bull in the China shop of under a week within the business, and suddenly here's a list of all the changes, here's what needs to change with the product. Suddenly, I'm an expert on everything. I've been here a week. Yes, I've got a background. Yes, I've done things successfully before, but that individual 
was there a week? And, and how much can you learn in a week? So my style is to come in and assimilate, is to understand yeah. what, what's gone before and why. So for example, what's, what's the ideal, what, what today is the customer persona? What's the ideal customer profile to, that, that you think it is today in the business? Um, who's, what's the target market? What's your average deal size? What, you know, what's our men's motives? How long is the average trajectory of quote to cash? Uh, what's our win rate? Who do we lose to? What are the chances? Just to understand and ask lots of questions, to understand the what, to understand the what, you know, what territory and verticals do we, do we focus on any? I'm not saying we should, but do we? And if we do, how do we choose? How do we cho end up choosing those? What, why are we in that vertical? So I want to question everything, not to prove things are wrong, not to prove, oh, I'm, I'm cleverer than you and or everything you've done is wrong, but to try and understand why are we, why, what, this is the baseline we're starting from. Why? How did we get here? Then what I'm going to look for is what, what might change, right? Is that stop, start, continue? Okay, so, okay, so you've, you explained this is the average deal value. Why is it that average deal value? Is, is it a technology or technological limitation or a limitation of the product or service? Or is it, it's just we've fallen into that and we service that type of customer in that vertical or that size? Is there a reason for it or is it just that we fell into that? Is it because you've been told to focus on those and not go after anything bigger? In which case, why? What is the limiting factor? Is it a self-limiting belief or something that mean, you know, if we go higher, we, we're gonna we're gonna have a higher loss loss rate, for example. So I want to understand all that because by understanding it, I can then make judgment calls from experience, um, from prior experience is of okay, what what could change and by how far? Because there's no point yeah. coming in and saying, look, what's your average deal value? Oh, it's five thousand dollars pounds, whatever. Uh, okay. We're going to go after making the average a hundred thousand. Okay, hang on a second. How are you going to do that? That's a big leap, right? With what logic? As opposed to saying, "Well, look, this is why I think we've got a five thousand average. This is the target market that we've got. This is the references that we've got." But for example, you might identify. Has anyone looked at this and said and, and realised of all these customers we've got, we've got twenty in the same vertical sector here? What's to stop us now leveraging that in perhaps it's a campaign or just a focused sales effort and going after organizations in that same market slightly bigger? Right. Not 10 times bigger, but can we can we move the average sales value if it's five thousand dollars? Can we move it ten thousand dollars over the next six to nine months? But, and it varies in every business how long what the, what the growth is. But it's for me, it's looking at where are those marginal gains I can get, for example, right. For example, you might look at the win rate and go, well, uh, oh, what's the win rate we've got? Oh, it's quite, you know, we, we win one, one in five. Okay. But by breaking out that analysis even further, you might say, well, we win one in five overall. But when we're in this particular type of customer, uh, we appear to be up against this competitor and we win one in 2.7. So how do we do more of that? How do we do more of that type? Has anyone thought, well, how do we focus there? How do we get more customer target customer data in that area? Do we know who, how many, how many other customers meet that sweet spot that we seem to do well in exist? Have we got the data? Let's do the analysis. Oh, well, actually there's 2000 more customers there. And we've only got 20 of them. Okay. Yeah. And we have a higher win rate and the average deal value is bigger. So maybe we should do more of that. It's, it's that type of thing. Often what I find is the, the clues are there, just no one's, no one's linked them together. No one's pinpointed and said, and, and now analyze the data enough. It isn't just looking at averages, it's breaking it out and saying, mm -hmm. okay, there's the overall data, but what's the subsets we can pull out? What, what, what's, what's happening in data between, in the deals naught to $10,000, what happens? Okay, but the deals 10 to $20,000, what happens? Well, we have, a, we have a lower win rate or a higher win rate, but we just don't find many of them. Okay, so it might be we can execute there, we can win, but we haven't got the data. You're not targeting them, guys. We just haven't made a concerted effort. So it's so that that the first approach for me is understand the ifs, the whys, the wheres, the, all this piece. The second one then is to try and make some smart decisions that A are achievable and B that the team's gonna buy into, because there's no point coming in 
and acting like a bull, that bull in the china shop and structuring the world that are things you're not going to achieve so i look for marginal gains can i come up with a plan that says right over the next six nine twelve months whatever it is we're going to go we're going to increase the average deal value we're going to uh, increase the win rate so we're going to increase all of these metrics slightly and here's how we're going to do it in a way that they but people believe in it and and, and think okay. okay this is one step at a time and invariably what i find is as you go along those milestones as you measure those kpis let's say on a quarterly basis some of them you overachieve and some of them you over underachieve but you're moving in the right direction and the more you achieve that the more you learn what works and what doesn't work in that organization with that product or service to that target market and the more you get that the more the team starts to believe and come up with ideas and be willing to try different things and yeah. that's all i've done in each of these smaller companies is it's it's a it's a methodic approach that's repeatable but it isn't the same metrics i don't come in and say i can double your average deal value i can do because i don't know until right. i assimilate what am i starting from mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good information too. I remember when I was in college and I had a management course and the professor, one of the things he said that I always remembered was make haste slowly, right? And so it's the same thing where you're saying, get in there, get information, get to know the people, get to know the systems, you know, and then from there you could figure out where some of those changes are that may need to, you know, be taking place. So I always appreciated that. And it's the same thing. Right I was just going to say one other thing about when I used to work in a company prior to having my own, um, there was a girl and I that were always working well together and finding when there was something that was not working as efficiently as we thought, and we came up with a process to improve it. And then when the company decided to hire like an operations person to help the president, they just came in and just started making, you know, changes without even talking with us. And we were thinking like, if he would have just told us what he was thinking, we could have given our input and what we thought could happen. And so that was my experience yeah. from that. So is it, yeah. Yeah, so what I was going to say is the people is the important piece, right? To, to, to ask questions and get an understanding. Because in your example there, it, it's okay to fail, right? Fail fast and learn <laughs> and progress. Otherwise, you're not, if, you're not, if you're not failing to some degree, you're not trying hard enough. But don't fail where you didn't need to, right? Where someone else could have absolutely provided knowledge or insight. And often those insights are hidden there in the business. I've joined companies before and start and spoken to people and made them feel comfortable and they've and they've shared that they're, they're doing something today often it's a stop action right they're doing something today where you ask them and go but why why are you doing it that way and it's well i've been told to do this right okay, but what would you do you're in the role what would you do differently and why and they often have great insight but they haven't felt comfortable for whatever reason to speak up or to explain no one's no one's asked them before or trying to gain their insight, they're doing the job. I said, well, right. well, let's figure out together if that if that might be a better approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's so true to really start talking to the people that are doing those tasks because they probably have insight. And if they don't feel that they have been empowered to even make any of those changes or suggestions, you know, they're just going to do the same old thing, right? So, I, I think that's really important. But I wanted to ask then, you're talking about, you know, getting assimilated with the group and, you know, looking at some of these things. And so once you have done that, you've gotten, you know, kind of involved with some of the people, got to know them, maybe got some of their feedback, even started looking at those things that you can change. What would be your next step that you would recommend? So the next one is come up with, and what I always do is look at, okay, let's identify the key core relevant metrics that we're going to try and to adjust, document them document where you are today. And often that's the challenging part, right? I found because what you're saying is here's, here's some metrics we want to measure, but what I want ideally to have is to be able to retro go back and say, okay, if it, well, how has that looked for the last four quarters, eight quarters? How has that progressed? What has it been? And often I find that data isn't easy to get because if it's particular metrics that haven't been captured or have only been captured at at a high level and you want more granular breakout and the source isn't there, 
you know, and this often comes down to the CRM, what data has been captured previously, et cetera. But I want to know what's the trending been before? Because what I really want to say is what's the baseline we're starting from of the metrics that we've identified we think we can move that are going to make a, a difference to the business? So yeah, obvious ones are average deal size, win rate, um, the momentum of the deal, you know, the, the rate between creation and, and close, lost or closed one, how long does that take typically? Uh, structure of deals, depending on your business, it might be you have multi-year contracts or annual contracts or billing types. Where do, what buckets do they fit in? What have I got to start from? And, and then, okay, over what period, let's say it's that 12 months first year, what is the target I want to get each of those metrics to? And again, they've got to be achievable. Yes, have a stretch target, but don't, don't say your average deal closure today is 120 days. You want to get it down to 12 days. Right. unless you've got some magic where you know there's a fundamental thing you can do what i'd look at is well look it's 120 days from what i've got i can see some some data and from my experience that where i get you get a feel for where that's movable so in this instance i think okay over the first year we want to get that under to be under 90 days or under 100 or whatever's achievable the average deal value we want to move from five thousand dollars to nine thousand dollars the the win rate is currently one in five. Let's get it to one in four, because that means you're going to win. You're going to win more deals. They're going to be slightly bigger. You're going to win them slightly quicker, mm -hmm. right? So you, just those alone, those marginal gains will all compound each other to a, a much greater revenue result. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, identify the true. metrics, identify where you're starting from, what you believe are achievable goals, and, and, and have some idea of how you're going to do it, and then buy, get the teams buy into this is over this period what we're going to try to achieve this is the reasoning for it okay um and this is the methods we're going to use this is how we're going to do it some of it's going to be coaching the team it could just be down to conversations they have with clients um for example not to position a certain type of billing as the lead or you might want to change the structure of the commission plan to incent them and motivate them differently there's a number of things but how do we focus people on these are the important metrics we're going to measure them you know every month or quarter we're going to look at these how we're moving in the right direction how we're affecting them and, and we're going to have conversations around them and i'm going to help you with processes or methods what and then I, again it's another feedback loop of what is going to stop us achieving this and you've got to get the, t the people that are there and the team comfortable with giving you continual feedback not oh we couldn't possibly do that it's but why what will prevent us doing this what blocks are we going to face what do you need what blocks do you need removing what things do you need changing to enable you to support getting us to there because that's part of it as well right it's not just come in and say here's some numbers here's some metrics right let's go for it it's how do i support you in being able to support us to get to those numbers what needs to change what needs to what needs to be done new that start thing. What do we need to do that we're not doing today? What do we need to stop doing that's preventing us? And, the, and whatever it falls between those is the continue. It's a pretty fundamental discussion. Stop, start, continue. Everything is up for grabs. Tell me what we should stop doing. Tell me what we should be doing that we're not and what's working. Okay. Yep. So when you are looking at businesses and how they're going about their sales, what would you say that they are doing wrong in terms of getting those sales? So there's a, there's a whole, I'm going to rattle off some stuff here. There's a whole host of things I've seen. And the beauty of this, in my opinion, is they're, fun, they're fundamental, but they're not unsurmountable. This isn't, they're, none of them are rocket science. So things such as. Well, they all fall under the following, right? They all fall under not, not focusing on the basics. I think too many sales teams, and, and you mentioned at the beginning, I, I judge a number of sales awards. I also get to interview a lot of salespeople. So I get a lot of context around this. And I think too often there's over complexity fall into the selling process. Selling is typically you dealing with another human being and trying to figure out them as well, trying to figure out together, do we, is there value in us doing business together? Do you gain something from us doing business together? And, and can I, or is it not the right time or place for the engagement? Right? There's two humans engaging. And the things people miss, I think, are things like 
communication versus conversation. Mm. And that's linked to a thing I talk about called changing the channel, particularly because of COVID, the way we communicate and, and has, has changed or, or the perception. Um, rapport versus relationship. You know, people get these things muddled up and, and then don't focus on the right things. A lot of assumptiveness goes on. Questioning, and I talk about that often, salespeople's greatest asset is, in my opinion, is asking smart questions for a number of reasons. Um, that if, I know tw if I know 20 more things about this prospective customer and their project than someone else, I'm in a better position to either win that, win that as a, that, that individual, that business as a customer, or, or to make the right decision not to spend time on it and to disconnect, you know, it, it is to qualify out with the customer pro professionally, but we're not right for you, but sooner rather than later. So the more I know, the more I am uh, armed to be able to make the right decisions. So that's a biggie in my opinion. Um, and that includes asking questions of why you lose, right? And that's one of those simulations I do through that first bit is when, when, when you pull those stats together and you've got that win-loss rate is, is a good question to ask internally. You do the same tech questioning techniques is, so, so we, we, win, we win one in five, we win two, whatever our win rate is, great. When we lose, why do we lose, yeah. right? And, and I wanna understand why we lose in detail, not well, because we don't have this function, but is it? And a good exercise there, as someone senior coming in, is to, why don't you speak to some of those lost customers? I have to have some conversations, particularly ones where your, your team had invested a lot of time and effort with the customer over a period of time. Surely that customer, you know, that customer basically at some point said, sorry, we're not going to do business with you, but thank you. Well, well, thank you as well, but in return for all the effort we put in, would you be kind enough to give me share with me what, why we lost? What would what could we have done differently, if anything? Was it the product, the service, the salesperson's approach? What what was it? And it's not to try and win it back or, or turn it around. It's to understand where can we improve, right? Or to understand where we don't fit. Are we going after customers where we're not good? Well, I've just spoken to three customers we lost. And the learning I got from it is, in this scenario, there was a commonality. We, we're not going to win, guys. So maybe what we should do is, is when we identify that, we offer, we offer the customer to qualify out and we explain to them why. And we right. save ourselves another two months' work, right? right. Very smart. Yeah, so, so so I, mm -hmm. Go ahead. So I think there's a, a, a whole bag of things there where sales could do better. Mm -hmm. Well, you've mentioned a few different terms in there, so I would love to break down some of what you had mentioned in a little bit more detail. So the first thing that I heard you say was communication versus conversation. So can you touch on that? Sure. So, so we're here having a conversation, a like conversation where we're talking in real time and we have the pleasure of using video. So mm -hmm. what I've witnessed and it's become a habit and and it's been exasperated because of the pandemic and people working mm -hmm. remotely is a behavior and I, I when I've spoken about this before interestingly I have had people say well yeah we've noticed millennials and Zed sort of behave that way a little bit more and I think that's be, just because of the nature of the environment they've grown up within within technology but here, here, here's how this comes to light so a salesperson I say to a salesperson as a sales leader perhaps um Hey, how, how are you getting on with uh, prospect ABC? How, how are we doing? What, what, what's the, oh, I, and what you'll get is, oh, I, I chatted to them yesterday and X, da, 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 here's some information, great. What I've learned is to stop and just say, when, when you say chatted, was that, a, what, what do you mean? Again, it's about questioning, asking questions. And often I'll get, oh, um, well, I, I, we exchange emails. I emailed them and they emailed me back that. Okay, but is that chatted? Mm -hmm. right? Right. That's, that's a communication. That's a one-way communication followed by another one-way communication, right. which is open to misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't build rapport. It's not interactive. And is it the right thing to do? 
so sometimes communication is the right thing so 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 candy we, we've spoken and we've agreed we're gonna have a follow-up meeting and you and, and we've just discussed discussed some commercials and i'll say to you can thank you so much what i will do is i'll i'll, now, I'll confirm the follow-up meeting put it in the diary and i'll send you those commercials in writing and a copy of xyz document we just discussed so that you've got that as that we've both got that as a reference point and you can also validate my understanding is what we've just agreed fantastic the email that follows is then a communication and it's the right thing to do a different scenario would be we, we've had the conversation you email me a few days later saying Ian, yeah I, I, i'd like you to recut and can we can we have the commercials differently to how we discussed and uh, oh and, and can you do me your best price or can you do whatever the phrase is and i always say to salespeople that's the time when you want to have a conversation like yeah. you don't want to just email back because well what's changed i want to ask you i want to i want to have a dialogue with you doesn't mean i'm not going to confirm it in email but i want to have a dialogue and, and, and often i'll get told yeah but but they they've emailed so i'm going to reply because what do we all do habitually if you get a whatsapp message anyone listening if you get a whatsapp message i bet you reply on whatsapp if you get an sms you reply on sms if you get an email you reply on email it, it, it's we all do it and i get why we do it um how many of you have got a WhatsApp message and then called someone, or you got a, unless it says call me, of course, or you got a WhatsApp message, you emailed them back because it's counterintuitive that the conversation gets broken. But sometimes you don't want to have the conversation there. You want to have a, an actual conversation. You want to have a communication. So here, here's the easy way: you reply with an email. Uh, Candy, thank you so much for questioning that, so that I can, um, so we can handle that the best way possible, and I, and, and I don't get any misunderstand their thing. Are you available for a call uh, four o'clock today or or eleven thirty tomorrow morning? Right, and that leads into the bit I mentioned changing the channel. There's nothing right. wrong with changing the communication channel to a more appropriate one. But what I see salespeople do all the time, and, and I've been guilty of it, right? It's, it's breaking the habit because it's so easy, is every time you get an email, just pause and think, should the reply be on email? Or actually, is this better done as a conversation? Now, if it's just, can you just confirm? Um, it, it was, it, this, this did include the, the tax, or this did include the implementation, didn't it? Yeah, you can reply. Yeah, it, it, it sure did. It, it's, that's fine. But when it, it needs a conversation or you don't know what's behind it or it makes sense to ask a question, change the channel. Suggest a call. They want that information. Look, it's better if we have a conversation about it. Let, let's talk about it. Right? That, enables you to, that enables you to build more rapport anyway because you're talking. Mm -hmm. and, and I've seen too many emails mis misunderstood, miscommunicated, or how many times people have people listening had where you've replied to something like that and then you get ghosted. Right. And you don't know why, right? You've provided a bit of information they asked for. Now you phone them a few days later and you can't get hold of them. Did yeah. they not like the price? Did they not like the, what? Oh, I don't know. Why don't you know? Because you just did a communication. If you've done a conversation and I'm talking to you, Candy, and I say, well, look, we can't we can't we can't do the billing in that way i'm afraid or i say to you well look you're asking me for this this and this i, I can't do the combination which which is more important to you right. which is more important to you and you might go oh well my boss is a you, you've got a dialogue you're going to get so much more information and understanding and i might say well i, I get where you're coming from but what if we did this help me what else could we do and we're working it out together you're not doing that when you when you reply to a communication. You're just giving right. a, a, your interpretation of what they're asking, your answer, and hoping the answer lands in the right place. Right. And sometimes tones and emails or text messages can also be misinterpreted. And so sometimes it is much better to be able to just whether see each other so you could see, you know, body language or at least hear the tone of the voice or something like that, too. So there's no kind of misunderstanding. Totally. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. So you also mentioned earlier rapport versus relationship. So can you expand on that? Yeah, and, and my, when I talk, I tend to blend in as, as I started to go into the rapport piece. Um, so a sim similar example, how many times do we get uh, someone say, well, 
how are we going with such a how, how do you get on with uh how you get on with candy there you're discussing this with oh we have a great relationship and i'd like to question well well do you what what do you mean by relationship because that's it's easy to say right and, and often what's meant is i have good rapport right and, and often you can look at a crm and say well okay you've only had one phone call with them uh and it was an hour how how did that end up in the relationship because it's not and if i ask I, the customer if i ask the customer um do you feel you have a relationship with dave or sue the salesperson is the customer going to say that are they believing that and, and here's here's an example here's an example so i'm walking down the street and i i i, I see yourself or someone walking down the street candy and i say uh, excuse me you don't know me right you excuse me excuse me I, hope you don't mind you wouldn't have the time would you you're going to give me the time most people will, will give you the time because you've asked politely the rapport that i've engaged is enough for what i'm asking to get back okay. let's do it differently um oh excuse me excuse me uh, you got ten dollars can i have ten dollars am i getting ten dollars probably not right because i haven't built re enough rapport for what i'm asking for in return right Get the tender, but if I knew you, Candy, you're a friend of mine, Candy. We're walking down the street and wrapping up. Um, I haven't seen you in ages, Candy. Candy, how are you doing? I hope you don't mind. I'm, I'm really in a rush. I need ten dollars. I, I desperately need to. I've got a real problem, right? You're going to be reaching for your purse because if you've got a relationship with that person that used to work with them or something, you're right. you're going to the rapport's there for what I'm asking. If I said, can I have a thousand dollars? Different again, right? So the level the level of engagement you have balances what you're you're able to ask for mm -hmm. and, and the exa an example i get other people to think about this is i think you've got a piggy bank uh, you know a nice pig a, a porcelain piggy bank it's empty you put it on your desk every engagement i'm having with you now i can put put something in that piggy bank right if we have a friendly engagement if i have a phone call and we've had good and i've uh, and we've had a good chat uh, can it yet yeah, please and I, I'll, I'll get that done for you and then i send you I'm putting coins in the piggy bank and there's more coins going for a phone conversation than an email and there's more coins going for a video conversation than a phone call because I can naturally build more rapport but it's more human interaction and the more coins I put in the piggy bank gives me more right to take out right. so what I see too many salespeople doing is saying the relationship bit is hey look I've got $400 in the piggy bank I'm put it I'm put it in but I'm about to try and take it out I'm going to ask this customer for some favor or for something that's the $400 favor, but I haven't put $400 of rapport into that piggy bank to better call it a relationship or, or high rapport. I'm asking to take more out than I've put in. Okay. It's a pretty simple formula, right? So every engagement think, well, actually, if I do this as a conversation, if I build rapport um, and, I, and I follow up well, if I do all of these things, more coins going in the piggy bank there's more that customer is going to answer my questions is going to open up to me is going to feel more enamored of doing business with me it's going to be more open to me is not going to ghost me and all these things because if they're ghosting you if they're ghosting you i'd argue you probably you probably didn't even have as much rapport as you thought you had right right yeah because if you did at least build that rapport they would at least have the respect of giving a response to you than just completely ignoring you yeah and if you had a relationship they are going to get back to you right mm -hmm. it might be it might be sorry i missed you i've had i have customers sometimes who or prospective customers who will text me back when i'm trying to call them saying sorry can't talk now well mm -hmm. at, at least you're not just ignoring the you know who it is great right. that means you, you know you know especially when they say uh, hey and sorry i can't do it now but try me later in the week well, great that means you've probably recognized the number or i'm programmed in thank you for doing that um or they send you a whatsapp message back sorry i can't make the meeting but well that's there's some rapport there right otherwise what they, they just wouldn't turn up right right that's so true and i know you were briefly talking about social selling before so i would love for you to talk about you know the personal branding social selling and how does that fit into this whole concept of selling sure so i think so i fell into social selling a number of years ago and 
before it was called social selling. So it, it, it wasn't, oh, social selling, what's that? Let's figure it out. It was, how, I was interested in how do we stay relevant to the, the buyer dynamic? Customers have changed. We have all changed over the past 10, 15 years right. in how we interact with sellers, how we buy things through, you know, we've been conditioned by the likes of Amazon, by the likes right. of social media and, and all these things of, and, and technology has enabled us as buyers, consumer or business to shield ourselves from the seller. It's really easy. Your mobile phone rings, you glance at it. How many, how many have done this? You glance at the number and you think, do I know who this is? Do I want to pick this call up and take the risk of being in a conversation where I don't already know what it's going to be and I'm controlling whether I want to have that conversation at this point in time? So we let it go to voicemail. Right. And electronic mediums like email, et cetera, they're real easy because you're totally shielded and you decide if you reply or not and when you reply and when you look at it and all this <laughs> stuff. So the buyer was changing. So I, I was constantly looking at, well, and I was watching it happen of trying to just phone through to someone was getting harder because of this. So how do we make ourselves more relevant? How do we make it that it's not a cold call, but in the buyer's eyes, it's a warm call, even a tepid call, that they're willing to take to take the engagement. Right. Um, so I fell into looking at, well, LinkedIn was the obvious first step, right? Well, okay, people are on LinkedIn, you can look them up. And instead of the old world that I started from where you'd go into someone's office and you could, you could figure out stuff about them, the photographs they've got, they've got lots of sailing right. photos, they do sailing right. or, or you accidentally find out they used to work at a company you worked at or work or knew someone you knew or used to live somewhere. You can figure that stuff out now, a lot of it beforehand mm. um, by looking online. And then around that, it was, well, if I'm going to look at them, there's a chance they're going to see I viewed their profile and they're going to view back. And that's where your personal brand comes in. But well, if they're going to view back, you better make sure you look good. Right. And often I get people say, well, personal brand, ah, personal branding, that's for celebrities and stuff or influencers, and it's not relevant. I don't have that. Everyone has a personal brand, whether they like it or not. Your personal right. brand is what others say about you when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. And that personal brand can be uh, ascertained by them. Their perception of you can be from seeing you on something like this. It can be from they've met you at an event and you were very rude to them. It could be you've met them in a meeting. It could be they've just got your name uh, as somebody who works for this company and they've checked you out online. It can be a multitude of things. Today, often the first impression is digital though, right? But even pre-pandemic, you can check someone out. They come into the meeting, right. oh, you can check them out. I would argue that during pandemic, this accelerated because how many times during the pandemic were you on a web call with a group mm. of people? And you look right. at it and, and you didn't know some of the faces, right? So you see a face and they go, who's that? Who's, who's, who's Candy Messer? And it, well, guess what? Right now, while I'm talking to you on video, it wouldn't be hard for me on one of my other screens to put up LinkedIn and look for you. And if there's a group of people particularly, you're not watching what I'm one of 10 people doing. I can be checking your profile out while we're all on the call and no one knows I'm doing it. So easy. Right, so that's the reality that we're now in. So yes, you should care about your personal brand and that isn't about that you wanna be a celebrity. It's just making the same as in the old world, real world when you'd go in and make, you, you wouldn't turn up to a business meeting with bankers with open-toed sandals, ripped jeans right. and a cap on back to front, right? It's, it's not appropriate to the audience. So mm -hmm. it's, make sure your social profiles represent you in the way that's appropriate to your target audience. So if you are, and I always say this, if you are a, a children's entertainer, there's nothing wrong with having your, a clown face on, on the picture, right? Because that's what you do. Right. It's, authentic, it's authentic to your target audience. They're not going to judge you by it because that's what they expect to see. But don't do that if you're selling B2B to enterprise buyers, right? It's right. be appropriate. But assume people are going to come and check you out to look professional. And then the social selling piece is do your homework. And, 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 and here's, here's a, a moniker I came up with a few years ago. Be Sherlock, not Lestrade. Mm. 
What I mean by that is social selling is a skill in itself. It isn't just, it's the same as selling, right? Is, is there's two salespeople, one's a lot better than another. Why? Same in social selling. Social selling does not replace, firstly, your, your, your sales process. It, it is another tool in your kit bag to use, and it helps you get the engagement in the first place. It is a way to get a conversation open, conversation, using interaction on social media, which starts with looking at the company and the people that you want to engage with and figuring out how, how would I position to the, these individuals? How do I get across to them in an authentic manner, the value for them to have a conversation with me, mm. right? And that isn't necessarily just jumping in and sending them an email straight away. It might be um, that you want to connect to people around them. It might be you share some connections and you want to ask for an introduction. You want to ask about the individual. Um, there's a multitude of things, but the first thing you've got to do is back to what I said originally is, again, it's, it's about assimilate. So what being Sherlock is, is the following. And I've, I've tested this and challenged this, right, when I do training on this for, for groups of people. And I've said, right, I've pulled up a profile, a real world profile on a screen. I said, OK, tell me as a sales individual, the group of people in the room, tell me on this profile, you can go and look it up electronically in front of you, what you, what, what you could, what you see. Tell, tell, be Sherlock, tell me. And do you know what? I've had a whole room of people miss something that when I then highlight to them and say, right, what have you got? Oh, well, this and this and da, da, da. Okay, and I've said, okay, and I'll highlight something on the profile and they've all missed it. And yeah. it was there in plain sight. So the being Sherlock is this. Lestrade in the Sherlock stories of, of, of Scotland Yard will come into a crime scene. So your LinkedIn profile, come into the where the information is and look at the information that's available and make an assimilation to, ah, the butler did it. Sherlock will then turn up and have access to exactly the same information, okay? But he will spot 10 other things by being more diligent, more observant, and also spot correlations of things to be able to be in a better position, say the butler didn't do this. Same thing in, in social, social. So I've done this again and again. One example was with one of my team in a, a few companies ago, we were to go and see a customer. So I looked up and said, right, well, who are the people we're, we're, we're going to meet with? Great. And I, and I looked it up at the profiles and then we get to the meeting and with my sales individual. So in the meeting, I did something which pretty simple. And afterwards, the sales interview was like, what? And all I'd done is spot up the LinkedIn profiles. I asked the two, two, two of the key people in the room, I, I in building rapport at the beginning, said, so, um, so which one of you two follows each other then? And they looked at me and, and paused and, and they knew why. And they went, ah, oh, and they made a whole, and we had a whole story. The reason being on their profiles, I had correlated, cross correlated that over their career, they both worked at the same three companies at the same time. Mm. They'd worked together three times in three separate businesses. Mm. So I raised it, right? And they, I got from them, um, oh, you've done your homework. Straight <laughs> away, right? You, holy moly because i've spotted it mm -hmm. and then we had a whole conversation about it and a whole joke about it and it opened up some other things and there's there's a whole load of rapport and my salesperson afterwards the meeting was like holy moly i said it's simple mm -hmm. i didn't do anything clever or rocket science it was there it was in plain sight all it needed was for me to spot it to care enough right. to spot it and then i could bring that up in the meeting in the appropriate way i went in there knowing i was going to bring that up because it was just an obvious thing, right? An obvious question. So how come you two have worked together? Through? Who's following who then? And they told me the story of how it happened. Oh, and, and then I went and, and right, we're in conversation, went into, right? And I bet anything, other salespeople from other companies wouldn't have spotted that. Mm -hmm. So straight away, doesn't mean you're gonna win the deal, but what I'm right. looking at is straight away, I've got more rapport. People buy from people they like and trust. Right. Mm -hmm. So true, so true. Well, I know we're getting close to the end of the time that we have together. This has been great information. I'm sure we could talk about this so much more and even you know a deeper dive. Um, but if anyone has any questions and wants to connect with you, how can they reach you? 
Sure, and, and this this is a personal branding hint in itself, I guess. So if you go to ianmoyce.co.uk or ianmoyce.cloud, those will take you to my LinkedIn and so and Twitter profiles. And it's real easy, right? But you buy you buy your, your own domains, cost cost a few bucks a year, and you just point them where you want to point them. So instead of saying, my, my name's fairly friendly for that, right? But if your name was Paul Smith, for example, I would hate to be saying now, yeah, go to LinkedIn and search for Paul Smith, but, but don't right. search for Paul Smith in Wokingham, UK and, and search for one up sales. And because you, you have to, to narrow it down. Otherwise you've given the audience, the customer, all the effort mm. to take it away from them. There you go. There's two addresses. You go there, it will take you straight to the social profiles. You don't have to go on the platform and search. You're straight there. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ian, for being a guest on my show. I really appreciate your sharing your expertise. Thank you so much, Candy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do want to also thank the listener for tuning in today. I hope you found this topic interesting and that answered some of your questions about revenue growth through marginal gains and the right focal areas. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to Ian at the links that he shared or send us a message at media at AB and p.com and would you please share our show information with those you know i'd greatly appreciate your support i hope you can join us for next week's topic topic saving money for our future and please remember you can connect with us on twitter facebook and linkedin and my website is a b and p.com also remember you can find the podcast podcast posted on multiple favorite podcast platforms, including Google, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to Biz Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next Tuesday. Have a terrific week.